Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 24, going out on July 29, 2019. This podcast is for Red Sneaker writers, people who are serious about having a writing career and looking for some practical knowledge to help them do it. This is going to be a very special episode of the podcast. Instead of the usual interview, instead, this time I'm recording live from our Red Sneaker writing retreat in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I've got the whole small group surrounding me right now. Say hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. (laughs) And I'll be picking their brains and asking them to weigh in on the news stories. And later, we'll talk about the writing retreat itself. Why are people here? And what are they hoping to get out of it? And maybe how could something like this benefit you? That's going to come later. First, the news. I have several news items to talk about this time around, but I want to start with what's probably the most controversial news story going on right now. That has to do with Audible's announcement that they're going to start, that they're at least thinking about starting adding captions to their e-books, which has caused quite a firestorm in the publishing industry. And thanks to one of my podcast listeners who sent me a link to one of the stories about this, suggesting that I talk about it on the podcast. Your wish, my command, here it is. Audible is basically saying that they're going to add a sort of streaming caption to some kind of device, your phone or whatever you're listening to the audio book on, sort of like the closed captioning that you might see on your television when you're watching it, so that people can look at the words at the same time they're listening to the audio book. Since Audible, which of course is owned by Amazon, is the leading seller of audio books, this is a big deal. And a lot of people aren't happy about it. They're saying, so basically you're sending a free ebook with the audiobook because you've only got the audiobooks, not the ebook rights. And that's a problem. The Authors Guild has released a statement and they're calling it what, quote, appears to be outright willful copyright infringement. That's about as straightforward as it could be. They say it will, quote, inevitably lead to fewer ebook sales and lower royalties for authors for both their traditionally published and self-published books. Audible, of course, disagrees. They say, no, it's, it's not a separate document. It's not something that you can detach from the audiobook. It's basically just a streaming caption going along with it. So they're saying it's not the same thing, but a lot of people, particularly copyright specialists, are saying, sure looks like an audiobook to me, whether it's on a screen or in a separate detached document. It looks like the same thing. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy. Now, one of the people with me at this small group retreat is my wife, Laura Bernhardt, who, in addition to being the author of several books, has narrated many audiobooks herself. Laura, what do you think about this controversy? Well, I understand that um, the original data is coming from some testing that they uh, performed with some students um, showing that seeing and hearing the text simultaneously proved beneficial to them. But I I think in the real world, people opt to go with an audio book to accompany them to places where they don't have a screen in front of them. Uh, I hear people say that they uh, will listen to an audiobook while they're doing housework, while they're driving. I know people who listen at work when they are maybe on an assembly line doing something repetitive. Uh, they don't have a screen in front of them. So um, despite uh, Amazon and Audible's claims that this will be beneficial, uh, I, I don't see where it's actually usable uh, for people who typically go the, the audiobook route. You are in a unique position because you've not only narrated audiobooks, your own and other people's, but you're an author yourself. So as an author, somebody who writes, presumably, I mean, ideally for profit and enters into contracts with publishers, does it offend you to suggest that somebody is going to have a print version of your book streaming when all they've contracted for are audiobook rights? That's a good question. And that's exactly where my mind went as soon as I 
heard about this. Even the books that I've only recorded the audiobook, you might think, well, it doesn't it doesn't matter to her either way. But but you're right. Like like others, I have uh, also authored books. And the idea that somebody would simply get the audiobook and then receive what amounts to a free ebook along with it does bother me. Yes, it does. Um, you know, sure, some sales come through, say Kindle Unlimited, where you you wouldn't perhaps be affected by that. But I also have a lot of just straight up uh, print and ebook sales unassociated with the audiobook. It's not sitting well with me. I'll put it that way. <laughs> That's fair enough. My background, of course, is a lawyer, so I'm reducing it to a legal issue and thinking Audible has not contracted for the ebook rights, exactly. whether they're streaming it or attaching it in a separate document. That's not in the contract. Of course, if that's the position the Authors Guild or others take, what's going to happen? They're going to change their contract. Now, are you going to not do the audiobook contract with Audible because they've started at, as, I mean, they're the number one seller of audiobooks in the country. Are you going to say no because they start captioning, Laura? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tough question. That's that's something that is just starting to, uh, you know, I'm just starting to think about that. Uh, it, it doesn't sound good either way. I don't really like where this is going, and I'm... I'm really hoping that we we are we are not reduced to making that decision. I just don't think there's a good outcome either way. It's it's disturbing to me. Right. Well, we'll keep uh, following this issue. See if possibly Audible decides to back down at some point in the future. The second news item I wanted to talk about is also of a legal nature, but not boring. I promise. This has to do with the Case Act, which looks like it's getting close to becoming a reality. The Case Act is called CASE. That's an acronym for Copyright Alternative and Small Claims Enforcement. The idea is basically to create a small claims court for copyright cases like those that authors might be engaged in at one time or another. Of course, the normal civil courts, state and federal, have always been available to people. The problem is that on average, statistics show that to successfully prosecute a copyright claim in the courts requires about a quarter of a million bucks in court and legal fees. And who's got that? The idea of about a small of a small claims court would be something less expensive, possibly something you could even represent yourself. And it might be affordable to other people, which might make it more realistic. Problem, of course, is that if you create a small claims court, we authors aren't the only ones who could conceivably use it. I mean, it should be that way, right? Because the whole world should be revolving around law, uh, authors, but unfortunately it doesn't. Did I say lawyers? Because that's closer to the reality. What might happen is that you start seeing uh, corporations taking advantage of this as well, publishing companies and others who are wanting to hassle somebody because they quoted a line of a book in their blog or or something of that nature. If you create easier access to the courts for anybody you've created it for everybody but i still tend to think this is a step in the right direction third news item has to do with wattpad you've heard me talk about wattpad in this on this podcast in the past any of you any of you here listen to wattpad you have john haven't you you've got friends on wattpad we've seen a lot of People who have turned Wattpad into careers, uh, building their audience on Wattpad where people can read your work for free and eventually building enough of an audience that traditional publishing comes knocking. What's happening now is that for the first time Wattpad is rolling out what they, what people call monetization programs, pro- pro- programs, meaning for the first time instead of just making their money from advertising or side deals, there's going to be some money paid to authors or money paid for reading. There are two programs. The first of them is Wattpad Paid Stories, in which they are actually going to pay authors. Imagine that idea, authors getting paid for their work instead of posting it for free on Wattpad. People are actually going to be paid for the stories because they've got a contract with Wattpad. At that point, Wattpad really does become a real-life alternative publishing company. Here's the catch. At least for now, you have to be invited to contribute to the Paid Stories program. And, of course, they're going to look for people who have name value, name recognition value, and some kind of track record or audience. You can apply 
to be considered for it there. And if you go to the Wattpad, anybody out there interested, you can go and apply to be one of their Wattpad paid stories writers. There's also a premium program, the other money earning pr- program, which basically allows people to turn off advertisements while they're reading Wattpad stories. This seems more conventional to me. I mean, it's in the effect the same as a streaming service, Hulu, for instance. Uh, you know, if you pay more for your monthly s- subscription, you can turn off the advertisements or pay a few dollars less and sit through what seems like the same commercial over and over again. <laughs> it's your call, but that's a, that's the second less interesting uh, monetization program. But to have uh, people uh, have Wattpad actually paying people for their work, for their writing, I think turns them into a bona fide publishing company. And speaking of new upstarts that are bona fide publishing programs, that's my fourth and final news item. I've talked about Amazon publishing before. Here I'm not talking about people self-publishing at Amazon through programs like KDP, but I'm talking about Amazon's actual publishing division where they're contracting with authors to publish their books in ebook and or print and or audio and uh, having a lot of success with it. Just a couple of weeks ago, I think I reported that they had entered into a contract with Patricia Cornwell, one of the most successful female authors of all time, really one of the most successful authors. But we add that female tag because I think she's number two all time if you have a list of just female writers. But now they're adding Dean Koontz. Amazon Publishing has just signed a five-book deal with one of the best-selling authors in this country ever. Kuntz has got lifetime sales of over 500 million copies of his books. Think about that. 500 million copies. Wow. I mean, I'm almost there. Not quite, but, but close. Uh, no, I'm not even remotely close. So he's joining Sylvia Day and Robert Dagoni, one of the top thriller writers out there. Barry Eisler, another great writer. Amazon Publishing is not only selling a lot of books, they are slowly but surely consuming all those big name legacy publishers. Clearly, they're going to be a force to reckon with. Every time you make a publishing decision, as I've talked about in the past on this podcast, you got to decide, am I going with traditional publishing? Am I going with independent or self-publishing? Am I going with hybrid publishing? Something in between. But now we're seeing new alternatives. Maybe I'll go with Amazon publishing, which even though they've got Amazon in the name, they're in effect a traditional publisher. Wattpad, which so far is entirely online, but clearly is now paying authors for their work. This may be confusing for some, but speaking as myself, somebody who's been in this business for a long time, I think it's wonderful. The more paths to publication, the more ways for authors to get the recognition and compensation for their work that they deserve, the better. As I said before, for my interview for this podcast, we're going to do sort of a renegade group uh, interview with all the people. I got six people sitting around this table for this six, a small group workshop retreat. Retreat sounds so much more fun than workshop or seminar, right? And it's appropriate because we're out in Eureka Springs right now at the Writer's Colony at Derry Hollow, one of the most beautiful places you could ever hope to spend some time writing. Every one of the rooms here is specially equipped to work for writers. The view is fantastic. The weather is great. It's so green everywhere. But we want to focus on the writing part. So I've got people from the group. I've got my wife, Laura, here. And I want to ask everybody. I, I mean, some people may not understand. You know, we've got writers' conferences like WriterCon that we do every year. But here we've got this pretty intensive five-day small group focusing on you and what works for you and what's best for you kind of small group seminar. So I'm looking to my left. Julio Panera, who I've worked with, but I'll let you talk about that. Julio, what brought you here? So a couple of years ago, I took a class through Writer's Digest uh, with Bill, and it was I was just getting started on a novel and needed something to get me kick-started, and I got a lot out of it. And uh, it sort of got me going. That was a couple of years ago. Kind of stood stale for a bit, and I 